Here's a few news articles. Um, this woman says she was fired because of tweeting on Trump and Dershowitz. And this seems to be true. And um, I've seen some people say that this shows uh, Dershowitz being a hypocrite because he's a, a right winger on Fox News and always talking about cancel culture and how people shouldn't be complaining about insults. But the problem is she's a Yale professor of psychiatry. And, you know, I, was, I think that her department head has a point. There is a rule in psychiatry that, um, that's got a name of some kind uh, saying that you cannot diagnose somebody that you haven't really in, inspected personally. You can't take like a public figure like Trump or for that matter Dershowitz and take their public statements and issue a psychiatric diagnosis. It's a violation of one of the rules of being a psychiatrist. So, and they told her, knock it off or we'll have to fire you. And she um, kept on doing it. So, you know, that's, um, that's the point. They're complaining that her clinical judgment and professionalism are bad because she is violating one of the rules of psychiatry. And I know there are people, the Goldwater rule, that's it. There are people writing books. Trump is nuts and this and that argument, and various people are complaining on these grounds that the standard ethics of psychiatry say that you should not be p claiming that somebody is nuts under these conditions. Now, some people think you should overlook the Goldwater rule or it's out of date or something, but, you know, I think the university's on fairly firm grounds to fire her for a thing like that. Um, so, anyway, I'm sure it'll be carrying on with battling on both sides, but, um, but it's not as simple as just fancying somebody for no reason. There is a reasonably solid reason to fire you for that. And there were people who wanted to fire me for tweeting. They didn't have the guts to actually go through it, but it would have been a much more clear situation of free speech in my case. I don't believe I was breaking the ethics of my profession by criticizing my administration. <laughs> uh, so apparently a bunch of U.S. states are going to start doing cloud seeding where you stick um, something up you stick some kind of particles in the cloud to make it rain, um, silver iodide or something. And uh, anyway, some people argue about this. The obvious thing that surprises me is that it, if all it does is make the rainfall here instead of the clouds going making the rainfall somewhere else. Oh, I said that the city college administrators should all be fired, and I think after that they pretty much all were. So <laughs> I would argue the judgment of history is with me. But one of the administrators who resigned shortly after that tried to have me fired for tweeting, for saying that. Um, the administrators were doing things that bothered me. And uh, they've continued to do more and more things that bother everybody, including, you know, now firing a large portion of the professors and canceling a lot of the classes, which I imagine some of you will notice next semester. Uh, the place has been sort of burning down for about 15 years, with nobody in charge and just one disastrous administration after another. They've shrunk from 90,000 students to 20,000 in nine years. That's pretty incredible. You scare away like 70% of your customers. That's, uh, that's not healthy. Anyway, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, a bunch of Western states are going to start doing cloud seeding to get more rain on them. Um, apparently, we're in a serious drought in all the Western states. This is the effect of the climate change here. You know, Texas has got the... Uh, the cold weather freezing the pipes, and so did Alabama. And what we have is hot summers and um, fire seasons. So we're all seeing drastic changes in the climate because global warming has now melted enough of the ice caps and changed the temperature enough that it has disrupted the circuits in the ocean and in the atmosphere that give us our normal weather. And so they say it's like opening the refrigerator. The Arctic air that should have just gone around North Pole swooped down into like Alabama and Texas. And we're going to see more and more of this crazy unstable weather where the pattern of the seasons is now disrupted. Not a good thing. And that's why I've heard a lot of uh, people say that if um, students just beginning in college, what they should be doing if you want a long-term career is studying uh, carbon fixation technology. Because that's going to be the growth industry of the next couple of generations is building equipment to undo all the damage that we have done to the atmosphere. And that might well be true. So this one is pretty surprising. As, as I think everybody knows now, the, uh, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia personally ordered the execution of a journalist that criticized him. 
and then he covered it up and then he tried to blame it on his underlings and all that jazz. What I didn't know is later he took um, a UN investigator who was investigating that and they told her she better knock it off or they would send people to take care of her too. So apparently they are continuing to just execute people, even like UN investigators that are not Saudi citizens, and send people death threats. They didn't apparently kill this person, but you know, it's, uh, it's pretty disturbing. <laughs> they seem to be out of control and they do not seem to be getting the message that you can't act like this in the modern world. Um, of course, uh, Putin is very much the same. He just poisons anybody that criticizes him or irritates him. He's killed 20 journalists so far that we know of and all these political opponents. And, you know, this is, uh, there are quite a few leaders in the world that just kill people that irritate them. <laughs> also in North Korea, they kill members of their own family, like the old uh, royal families in Europe. So there's plenty of places that do it. And apparently Saudi Arabia is that way too. But it certainly makes it a little dodgy to deal with them. So this is something I hadn't heard of. I heard people complaining about HP. Now apparently you have to subscribe to some kind of, subs pay some kind of regular subscription to HP. And if you don't, then they will cancel your cartridges. So you can't even use the ink that's in the cartridges. I've heard of this thing where HP printers have to have genuine HP cartridges, but now they'll cancel it. So you can't even use the ink that's in it because you didn't pay a continuing subscription. So HP is just getting more and more outrageous here. Um, this immediately makes me think about ways to hack the cartridge or hack the printer. <laughs> well, that's what a lot of people are saying. A lot of people are getting really mad at HP. This does seem pretty awful. And um, anyway, it, my first thought, though, is it's a fun little CTF problem. You know, there must be some way to alter the hardware or the software of the cartridge or the printer to fix this. <laughs> I would think. But, you know, anyway, um, certainly it is a pretty lousy thing to do. Of course, I don't know why anybody wants a printer anymore. I haven't had a printer in years. Paper is over, man. You might as well have like a piece of granite and a chisel as far as I'm concerned. But anyway, um, a student sent this to me yesterday or the day before. Uh, so Android had some kind of update to WebView, which is the feature. Yeah, I wonder if just disconnecting it from the Wi-Fi would work if you do it before you cancel your subscription. So it never gets to find that out. That might be true. Anyway, um, so Web WebView is the component in Android apps that let you open a web page inside an app. And apparently they put a bad update f that's affecting uh, Samsung phones. And the apps are crashing that have this web view update, so you have to roll back the update. This certainly happens a lot with Windows, that you get a bad Windows update that breaks things and you have to roll it back. But apparently it's happening with Android now, too. And so uh, Biden has claimed he's going to enforce um, some of America's moral values in dealing with other nations, which would be uh, a return to the way things used to be before Trump. And uh, so now they're going to have sanctions against Chinese officials for Uyghurs, apparently. Uh, so many terrible things about what they're doing to the Uyghurs. They just seem to be wiping out their culture, systematically raping and torturing the people. It just seems horrible. Uyghurs are apparently the Muslim minority in China. I don't know much of anything about it, but I hear these horrible stories of survivors. It certainly does seem like we ought to be protesting this. So now they're having some sanctions against them. I don't think anybody wants to go to war with China over this, but you certainly want to express some kind of displeasure and have some kind of pressure put on them for whatever good sanctions will do. So um, it might be nice. Anyway, um, all right. So let me get down to the official stuff today. I'm not going to cover a chapter in the book. This is when I wanted to pick up with some of the stuff that I've added that's not in this malware analysis book. So all I want to do is demonstrate a few projects here. That's my plan for today. And this is, um, so I want to do 121, 124, 126, and start you on the assembler CTF. These are extra credit things you can do, but they, I like them a lot because they help me understand more about um, Windows, about, um, yeah, Windows internals. So we'll start with one, it's 121. And then 124. I'm going to break them up into separate videos. So let's start with 121 here. All right. And so if you get the Flare VM, by the way, you never really need the Flare VM. If you have a weak machine without enough hard disk space or something, you could take a Windows 10 VM and install the tools you need. 
and it would be okay because just like when I used to teach the pen testing courses and we used Kali, the Flare VM has about a hundred tools and I'm really only using like three or four of them. So you could, um, but anyway, the Flare VM is an easy way to do it. So um, let me just go through this one a bit. So let's get, here's a my Flare VM. And I don't think I've got putty on this. I was doing a lot of projects, but I don't think I did this one. Looks like I don't have putty, so let's get putty. So I copy this thing. The link address, let me shrink this over to the side. Okay. And now I will open a browser and put that in the, here. Okay, and there's putty. So I save that file. And it's real small, so it doesn't take any time to come down. And now if I look in Downloads, I've got Putty. And if you're familiar with modern versions of Windows, they don't like to let you run a file you just downloaded. So you have to go into Properties and unblock it first. So unblock it, and then, uh, then it will let me run Putty. All right, and then we're going to check the hash. Uh, oh, I'm out of check this. I don't think this hash my files utility is in the modern version anymore. Right click. Oh, yeah, hash my files is here. Okay, so this is from February. Anyway, if it's not there, you can use hash calc. I think in the one I made in March, they didn't have this hash my files anymore, and you'd have to use a different utility. But anyway, the uh, SHA-256 is 9F9, and this is 9F9, so this file is good. It's the intact file I wanted to mess with. Okay, so if you launch PuTTY, it opens this window, and then you can put in the name of a server and connect to that server. That's all it does. And I don't really care about any of that functionality. In this course, all I care about is that this is an executable file, and you can see that it runs. And we're going to mess with this executable file. So we're going to um, compress it with um, UPX. And, th and this machine, UPX, is already installed. UPX is the ultimate packer for executables. And this does something very strange to files, which is what we're going to look at. And it is one of the tools that people use to compress malware, although they often write custom packers because people have learned how to use UPX. So, um, all right. Uh, I don't think I want to be in my desktop. I, want to be, I put it in my downloads folder, so let's do that. All right, let's make sure I got putty in here. And I do, all right. So let's go up here and uh, take this line here. All right, I don't know why I worked on the desktop when I did it there, but I'm not going to work on the desktop now. All right, there. So this is how you do it. UPX, put the output in puttycomp.exe and take the input from putty.exe. So now if I do dir, of put star dot star. You can see the original putty is 531k, but the compressed version is 267k. So it has made the file smaller. So that's interesting. And what happens when I try to run that putty comp? Let me sort them by name there. Here's putty comp. When you run it, it runs just the same. So that is kind of a conundrum. Now I'm, oh, I'm familiar with self-extracting zip files where you get something, and when you run it, it opens up a box, and you click Extract, and it automatically extracts it. And then the new file might be an EXE you could run. But this is a new thing to me, to have a compressed file, and you can still just run it from the compressed file. And that's what this packer does. It makes the file different on the hard drive than it will be on the disk. And so the SHA-256 is a compressed file. It should be 745. Let's check that. Make sure every, yep, 745, okay. All right, and it works. So we can now look at these things um, in PE Studio. So let's try that, PE Studio. And so if you load PuTTY, which is downloads, uh, probably date would take it, yeah, date takes it to the top. All right, PuTTY. All right, so here's PuTTY. And um, if you go to the sections, you see it has text, R data, data, and resource, the usual sections that you expect to see in a file. But if I make another instance of PE Studio, 
and open putty comp and then look at the sections here it's UPX0, UPX1, and resource. So it has, and not only that, UPX0. Now, if you look at a normal executable putty, if you look at the raw size and the virtual size, they're always pretty much the same. 5C1000, 5BF00, 5D1000, and uh, raw size is 1E1000 and 1D. It's always pretty much the same because when you launch a program, it takes the sections that exist on the disk and it just copies them into memory. And it's just a one-to-one -one copy, except it starts each section on an even thousand, so there's a little bit of extra gap added between the sections. But it's pretty much just a one-to-one -one copy. What's on the disk just goes right into RAM. And that is not true of Putty Comp. This UPX0 has a raw size of zero and a virtual size of 48,000. So this doesn't have anything stored on the disk at all it will unpack into memory and have something here. So what's happened is they've zipped all the contents of the normal sections, except for the resource section, which, by the way, is a mistake made by the auditor of the, the author of Putty. They misspelled the resource section, so they skipped it. So uh, the, uh, the author of UPX. So it compressed all the sections and put them in here in this UPX1 file. And when you run it, it's going to unzip this and build the sections in memory into this section. So that's what's going on. It's going to unzip it here and load it in memory. So it is a, basically a self-extracting zip file, but instead of just unzipping onto the disk, it unzips section by section into RAM. So the RAM copy is reproduced and can run. So that is a, a different kettle of fish. All right, and if you look at Putty Comp, you'll see indicators here. Um, PE Studio tries to decide if this is malicious and it notices suspicious activity. Here it notes the entry point is strange, the first section is writable which is strange, uh, various little things here are strange. None of these are like too fatal but they're disturbing. Virus total, uh, the file has not been found yet in the virus total, I think it will be eventually. Here's this one here, this is Normal putty. Virus total complains once about putty. Whoever this Apex engine is, they call it malicious. Uh, this is the thing to know about virus total. A lot of these antivirus engines are pretty sloppy and amateurish and flag innocent files. They keep on flagging my website for having malware on it from stupid things like this. They seem to just have volunteers in strange countries that just flag things as malicious without really understanding what they are. So, um, anyway. One, with one, only one engine flags it, but not very many others, it's probably not malicious. I'd look for like a, a reputable engine like Kaspersky or Semantic or something before I'd get too upset about it being malicious. And uh, all right. And here's even a few indicators in the genuine file. Um, so, you know, that's why you have these indicators, but you don't have, uh, you don't have like proof that it's malicious. All right. And then you can look at imports. In the genuine file, it's got 55 imports on some kind of blacklist, meaning they're functions that people don't recommend using. Apex medical, I don't know, I don't know what Apex is. I've never used the antivirus, so I don't even know what country it comes from. But um, it, I see it quite commonly that, that little companies I've never heard of mark uh, innocent flags with false positives. And when they flagged my page, I actually spent some time researching it and finding out why they flagged it and contacting people to get them to knock it off. Because uh, my corporate customers will complain that they can't load my web page anymore because their corporate uh, malware blocks it. And uh, then I have to bother arguing with people. And they'll do something like look at my page and see that I've got like hacking projects on my page and decide to mark the whole page as malicious or something. That's happened a few times. Anyway, so here's the imports, and see there's 312 libraries imported, a 55 are on a list of presumably suspicious, but these are real Windows API calls. And all this means is PuTTY is kind of old software, and it used kind of old techniques that are no longer recommended. So that's a genuine non-malicious file, and here's the compressed file. Look at the imports, there's only 14 total imports, four of them on a blacklist. So that's the point. All the actual code written by the developer of PuTTY has been compressed and hidden. And the only thing you're seeing here is the code that actually um, unzips it into memory. 
So it's really quite different. All right. So now you've got some idea what's in putty. And uh, there's some entropy. I don't think I'll worry about that. All right. We talked about the imports. All right. So now if you get the malware samples, um, and by the way, I didn't put it in this project, but I probably should. Um, I tried to disable the Windows Defender, but the latest updates in Windows 10 keep turning it back on. So if you do download the malware samples, you have to define uh, exceptions, or the Windows Defender will keep nuking them for you. So uh, I'll try to remember to add it to that project. I just added it to 124 and 126 project. Um, you have to go into Windows Defender, Defender, because even if you turn it off, Windows Defender settings, it will now automatically turn itself back on. And so that is pretty annoying for people like us that want to mess with malware. So virus and threat settings. Um, you go to manage settings and see now it's turned off, but it will turn itself back on before long. So I made a um, exclusion here. And if you go here to look at the exclusions, I've made a folder called CPMA and I excluded it from scanning. And you'll have to do that for all the places where you're going to put, you know, if you install Metasploit, you'll have to, to include that folder because Metasploit's all full of malware. Of course, it will set off all the signatures. So you have to tell the Windows Defender not to scan that. And you have to tell it not to scan any working folder where you're going to use a Metasploit. It doesn't care if it's on or off. Yeah, I know. Well, turning it off helps somewhat, but the problem is it automatically turns itself back on. I know Windows Defender is very annoying. I used to just uninstall it on my malware analysis machine, but Windows 10 will not let you uninstall it, and they won't even let you turn it off anymore. But they will let you declare exclusions, so that's all right. But you know, it's understandable. Microsoft uh, is kind of opposed to deliberately running malware on your machine, but you know, that's what we want to do. So anyway, I downloaded the practical malware analysis samples and put them in that folder so they're on this machine. And I made that exception so the antivirus won't nuke them. So anyway, you can examine that file to find its entry point and get a flag. And um, all right. And now we can look and examine how this works in Ollie Debug. So I'm going to open uh, both of those in Ollie Debug. So let's load Ollie and <clears throat> maximize the CPU. That's the normal way you do it. And we're going to open Putty which is in Downloads, Putty. OK, so here's the normal Putty. And let's have another Ollie. OK. And open Putty Comp. OK. And uh, this is going to tell me something's funny about this file. It's compressed or encrypted or something, which is, of course, true. We know it's compressed. So I'm just going to say, yes, it's OK. Go ahead and continue. They're just warning you, this is a funny looking file. Are you really sure you want to mess with it? And of course we are. So um, notice that the two files start at similar addresses, but they start with different commands. This one is push 60. That's the normal putty. This one starts with push AD. And notice the rest of it doesn't look the same at all. So this assembly code is different. And of course, that's reasonable because this is PuTTY and this is the decompressor that's loading PuTTY. All right, just a sec, I'm getting a headache. Which is probably from just being out in the sun today, but anyway. The American solution for everything is drugs. Anyway, so. Um, all right, so now we can look at the memory map. So let's start with normal putty and view memory. And you'll see that here's putty. It has text, R data, data, and resource loaded at 400,000, where e executables generally load. And if we look at um, putty compressed, we've got putty, upx0, upx1, and resource. 
which is uh, also loaded at 400,000, but it's really quite different. It didn't load a text section or anything. So that's why um, PE view got upset. You don't even have a text section, which is what you normally run. You're going to jump somewhere inside one of these sections here. And of course, what's going to happen is one of those sections will unpack it into memory. So um, we can look at the text line and dump it. So here's the normal one, right click. Uh, is it dump or dump in CPU? Dump. OK, good. So let's look at this text section and dump it. And that's full of assembly code. And if I go to the UPX0 line here and dump it, it's just empty. It's just all completely full of zeros. This is where the code is going to go after it gets decompressed. All right, so, uh, all right, now if I, this actually is a mistake, this should say UPX1. If I look at the UPX1 data here, um, UPX1, there, the other section, and I dump that, it tries to read it as assembly code. It does contain data, but if you look at the assembly code, it makes no sense at all. It's not really assembly code. This is just random bytes because what it is is compressed data. And the disassembler can't really figure out what it is. All right, but it's going to be decompressed by the program. All right, and this is, uh, all right, so we can now view the stub. Um, we see the push AD. You can notice something here. This is why this is kind of wonderful. Um, the decompressor is incredibly small. You can actually see the whole thing pretty easily. If I just, okay, now I should be able, there we, come on, move it, move down here. There we go. There's the decompressor. And I scroll down to see where it ends. And the last instruction is a jump to F0. And you will see it's not very far down. There, that's the end of it. The whole thing is about three screens of code because that's the decompressor. It really doesn't do much. All right, so now what we're going to do is, now that we can kind of see what this does, we saw there's an empty section full of zeros. There's another section all full of compressed data. Obviously, it needs to decompress that and build the sections that need to be there for putty. So it's this must be the decompressor. And when it's done, it's going to jump to some kind of starting point. So if I just put a breakpoint here with F2 and run to that point, it should have finished decompressing and then stop so I can examine and see what it's done. So I'm going to run the program. F9 will run it. And it runs um, paused, but it didn't hit the breakpoint. Now here we are. It, well, it ran F, did I hit F9, maybe it hit F7, hit F9 again. There we are. Now it ran to the breakpoint. So it finished. And now, if I look at the, um, if I go one more step and follow this jump, which is the F7 key, now I'm up here with a push 60, and that's beginning to do the same thing as this real program, push 60, push this, put that. Now I've reassembled putty. See, these instructions now match the genuine putty. So it decompressed that stuff and rebuilt in memory the assembly code for putty. So that's pretty cool. All right. So now you see how it works. And so that's the point. This is how a general feature we talked about many times in this course. If you have malware that does something screwy, like decrypt some encrypted strings or unpack some packed thing, you can try to figure out what the encryption routine is or what the packer is and reproduce it. But what's much easier is what we just did here. Find out where their unpacker is and run their unpacker and then stop. And then you get the unpacked stuff. The grayed out code in between the interpreted code, this code here, um, I think that must be code that it did not successfully um, disassemble. And you can see 8BC7 should have been here. Uh, this looks like the, um, it's confused. You know, it's the right bytes, but for some reason, uh, Ollie seems confused about it. 
Yeah, it just failed to correctly uh, interpret it. But I think I can actually, let's try this. Let's go forward a few more steps and see what happens if I actually execute that code. See if Ollie figures it out. So I do that. I push, I push. Oh, because it moved. No, it called. See here it called something. And it may never come back. In fact, um, if it didn't call, I don't know if it's ever going to get here. You know, this might be what's wrong. Because this called putty. And it well, it might return. I don't know. Let's see. Let's try FH. And then FH. And see, here it is executing this code, even though Putty thinks it's raw bytes. So Putty has been confused by this activity. Or I mean, not Putty, but Ollie. You know, this will also happen in Ida. Ollie is confused now because this section was just supposed to be a data section. Then it unzipped and put code in there. Then it started running the code. And the debugger is now confused. It doesn't know if this stuff is code or data, but it can run it, but it's not interpreting it properly here. And that's, by the way, why you have all these buttons. There's a way to mark this segment as code, to tell the debugger to interpret it as code. And you can do that in Ida, too. I'm not good at it, so I'm not going to struggle with it. But this happens. You sometimes have to manually tell it, no, interpret this as code. Stop interpreting it as data. It's a very good question. Anyway, so I don't think I'll keep doing it in live demo. You've seen the point. But the point is, if you want to decompress this thing, if you did not know what UPX was, or you had some kind of custom decompressor, you could do this. You could find the decompressor, run it, stop at that point, and then dump it back to disk, which is what this Ollie Dump plugin does. You can take what's in memory and dump it back to disk, and then you get a copy of the original executable, more or less. Now, when I did it, it wasn't accurate enough to make something that would really run. But the point is, then the code is just disassemblable, and the strings are readable and such. So you can make a dumped file, and you can then examine it in PE Studio and see the strings and such. So this is called uh, manually unpacking a file, where if you have some kind of packed file, you can use a debugger and that extension to grab the unpacked version from RAM and put it back into a file and make something more like a normal PE file to examine. And uh, that's the point of this project. And I thought it was pretty good exercise to start understanding these segments and how memory and the hard drive work together. So that's the first thing for today. So let me 